while you were just uh, showing those two watches, I find it interesting how the shades of the two are quite different, significantly yes. different. And uh, it's also the case, we've, we've started uh, to try and accumulate uh, the Red Red Brass Movement uh, series. Uh, I believe they made less of the rose gold brass movement pieces than they did uh, the platinum uh, gold dial um, uh, brass movement pieces. And if you look at those two as well, which we can highlight uh, after this, you'll see that the shades on both of those are quite different as well. And it's not because they were different dial materials. These are supposed to be the same dial treatment. The wonderful thing about FP Journe watches is that especially when you are looking at earlier examples, they're handmade in the most charming sense. That is, they're beautifully imperfect. There are variations from model to model, example to example, unit to unit. You'll even see on different parts parts of the dials of these watches, the shading varies a little bit. It's like if you want to look at the stern the Stern Frere dials created for Rolex during the 1950s. Across their various iterations, there are all sorts of different patina patterns that emerge. The same thing is evident in early FP Journe. And when I speak of early FP Journe, let me clarify what I mean. This right here, we can go back to it, guys. This is a Generation 1 tourbillon, so this is the model built from 1999 to 2003, Generation 1, Edition 4. The things that distinguish it from the first three sub-variants, you don't see a 1 through 20 individual numbering, so it's not part of the souscription or the subscription first series of 20. It doesn't feature a rounded Raymontoire cock, so it's not part of the second series, and it doesn't feature oversized screws on the dial, so it's not part of the third series. You know it's third because it's third or fourth because it has the large printing along the power reserve scale. And for reference, you can always tell if it's large printing, if it's approximately the same size as the minutes on the minutes scale. And then it has the flat Raymond cock, which came after the second series. So it's either third or fourth, and then the distinguishing feature is going to be small screws on the dial, showing that it is a fourth series. Very few of these made, a few hundred, no more. These are the most prized, these are the rarest. And again, a world premiere, this was the first time ever that a wristwatch featured both the tourbillon and a Raymond de Galité, a constant force mechanism. And you can actually see the constant force mechanism through the back. It's that blade spring that's visible. It's basically a power reserve that sits between the mainspring barrel and the escapement. A certain quantized amount of energy is transferred from the mainspring barrel to the Raymontoir and then from the Raymontoir to the escapement borne by the tourbillon cage. So it always receives the same impulsive energy whether the watch is fully wound or about to drop dead. There's the answer to the question on uh, what is that at 6 o'clock uh, with regards to the Remontoir de Galité there. Um, so there was some qu couple questions I know about uh, entry entry price level um, when it comes to Jordan. So uh, the, the entry price level is actually the Elegante 48. Uh, granted, uh, you know, it's a, a quartz watch. Uh, it's at 11 uh, is the price point on that. And then you go to the, the CB, which is 23.3. There's a question as to whether there uh, are different uh, dial colors available for it. Uh, I know that they, he had major issues last year with making. He's, the guy will never sell himself short. He always wants perfection. So uh, he, the success rate on the CB dial, I believe, is... Uh, you were there uh, most recently. The rejection rate is at, it's gone up a little bit lately. As uh, you know, they're they're focusing more heavily on, on doing all of that in house, and they want perfect repeatability. And so they've become more selective with the CB dial. So whatever the rejection rate was, it's actually increased and not disclosed. It's a very special process. I've seen it. I'm sworn to secrecy. I can't tell you a damn thing about it, other than that they they now do it themselves. And it is extraordinary how it's done. It's almost more like the way you make and finish a movement than how you make and finish a dial. Special. Uh, <laughs> That's I've, how to describe I've it. I've heard 80% of them get thrown out. I have no, you know, no proof of that. Um, I have heard stories on when, you know, even a, a, there's a, a minor, um, you know, issue with a dial. FP will throw it against the wall. I mean, the guy, you know, uh, I love that he's a little bit of a, of a hothead and wants perfection. I think it adds to the allure of, I, I refer to him as a, a living legend, the Jay-Z of watchmaking. I mean, it's a, just amazing to see, you know, what, what the guy's going to do next. A, lo a lot of flavor that man has, that's for sure. Yeah, and, and I'll be totally honest. FP Jorn is not afraid to be himself. Like, 
he's not afraid to piss people off if he doesn't get along with you. He's a friendly guy, he's an open guy, he does his best to speak English, but he's not the kind of guy who's gonna work a room and try to schmooze everyone. He's kind of a take it or leave it personality, a little bit gruff, a little bit, and he can be a little bit curt, and I think Pierre is, is pretty open about that. He says, you're either completely into the man or completely out, and that's okay. It's almost like the best of art. It's polarizing, it can be emotionally charged, and the man himself is exactly like that. He is the physical living extension of his watches, take it or leave it design. For example, these dials with the screws on the dial, with exposed components of the movement, with a style that was entirely F.P. Journe and only F.P. Journe when we first saw it in the 90s, these were polarizing, and yes, they were criticized. Today, everyone seems to love the brand. There was a time when this was so adventurous, more people probably reacted negatively to it than approved. And again, that is the story of the man himself. He is dedicated to his watches, passionate about his watches, committed to the French language, and not afraid to piss you off. And I have to say, although I don't love the man, and I'm not necessarily a fan of the man, I admire the manner, and I gotta admit, I can be a little bit like that too. Uh, <laughs> so, I see, I see a little bit of myself in that kind of a, a abrasive, on-off personality. He, he's authentic, he has absolutely no subterfuge. What you see is what you get. He doesn't know how to put on airs, and I love that. Very genuine, that's for sure. Uh, a lot of questions about uh, dials. You know, I think it's cool how um, Jorn owns their own dial manufacturing facility, and um, you know, there's there's questions as to whether the uh, is the guilloche on the CS stamped or engine turned. They're um, they're open about the fact that it is stamped. Now they do do real rose lathe guilloche. They have the equipment. They save it for special models and special occasions. And I think the best example of that would be not guilloche on a dial, but guilloche on a case. This is a great segue to the T30, by the way, guys. George, tell us a little bit about the T30, and then I'll geek out on calibers and tech. So this is also a tourbillon. It's it's interesting. You know, it's different in the sense that you know if we if we take if we uh, open up the Hunter case back, that's when you'll uh, get um, a, a better understanding of it. But this was a, a remodel off of the first uh, pocket watch, right? That uh, the first the watch. First, the first uh, pocket watch. I want to show you the guilloche, guys, just because I say they do that in-house, and it's not just on dials. This is all sterling silver and yeah. rose gold. Different material for him. Um, that is just badass. That is so awesome. Now, this was a 2013 series of 99 pieces in rose gold and sterling silver. Ten in platinum were also made, and they were actually sold after a lottery of 30 contestants, three from each of the 10 boutiques. The 10 winners were then selected and able to buy the watch. This was the 99-piece series that was a bit more democratic. Not much, but a bit more with 99 made. Now, what you're looking at is an architecture that almost perfectly recapitulates the design of F.P. Journe's first pocket watch from 1983. Now, that, that watch featured a tourbillon and a marine chronometer escapement. The changes here, aside from the fact that it is finished much, much better than that first watch, uh, personally, very little changes. It's the same feeling, it's the same emotion and commitment, but the chronometer escapement is gone, replaced by a beautifully finished oversized tourbillon cage that is one of the broadest and most exquisitely finished specular polish tourbillon cages you will ever see, and some of the largest kiln-fired blued screws you will ever encounter on something that is not a clock. Absolutely gorgeous with black polished cocks for the mainspring barrels, and you can see them actually lighting up and turning black alternately as they move this one through the light. A very special watch, as special on the outside as it is on the inside, and a heartfelt tribute to the man's very first timepiece, which he created because he said at the time he couldn't afford a tourbillon, he wanted to own one, and his solution was to make one for himself.